Um, write and think at the same time. That is, they use their writing process to help themselves to think. You do this. While you're writing your stuff, you're still thinking of your ideas. To help yourself do your thinking, you have to do your writing. You have to do this because you, the stuff you're thinking about is too damn complicated to just do it in your head. You should know that in classical rhetoric, that's an enormous mistake. I was taught in a classical model that says there are two separate functions. There's the thinking process and there's the writing process, as I constantly tell the story. I had a high school English teacher who said to me, Larry, there's two processes. There's thinking, there's writing. She said, you're not ready to write until you're done thinking, Ms. Johnson. And she said, to enforce this, I'm going to make sure that when you turn in every essay you turn in to me, you're going to turn in the outline that you use to do your thinking. This was not a problem. First I wrote the paper, <laughs> then I wrote the outline, <laughs> because it was inconceivable to me that you can just think and then do the writing. Well, most, almost everybody's like me. They think and write and write and think and think and write and write and think and think and write and write and think. Okay. This is a very good thing. And you should make sure that nothing I do today interferes with this process. <coughs> Because this is how you do your best thinking. But in the real world, not in school, in the real world, when you're done with this, you, have, you will have created a text. You will send that text to your readers. And in the real world, not the world you're in now, the function of that text is to cause readers to change what they think about the world. That's its job. It's to cause the readers to change what they think about the world. And whether or not it's valuable depends on whether or not the readers perceive that you have valuably changed what they think, or what they do, or how they decide. And I would be willing to bet that in your, co your schooling years, you virtually never did that. Was that what your writing was for as a student? When you wrote a paper, did you fail the paper if you didn't change what the teacher thought about the world? Was that the test? Was that how you got an A, B, C, D, or F? I'm getting a lot of those, like some people saying, oh, maybe, was it the test? <laughs> was it? All right, let's make it, let's start in high school. When you were writing in high school, were you changing the way your teachers saw the world when you wrote those high school papers? How about college? Were you changing the way your instructors saw the world when you wrote those college papers? I mean, every once in a while I have somebody who say, well, yeah, I mean, I had professors tell me that my work was so valuable to them. That was a lie? I mean, you know that. At least it was a lie in the sense of it didn't change what they thought. You know how I know it was a lie? Because if you had changed what they thought, they should have published your paper. Sometimes I have faculty say to me, oh, my st the student's writing is very helpful to me. I say, oh, yeah. They say, oh, yeah, I really do. I learn a lot. I say, yeah. I say, yeah. I say, then your student, right, reading your student stuff is part of your, like, your thinking process. Yeah. I say, okay, then how often do you go find student papers to read when you don't have to? And what's the answer? Never. <laughs> All right. All right. What made your writing valuable to them? What created the value for them? Your writing didn't. What did? Ideas. Pardon me? Ideas. No. <laughs> Here's what did. <laughs> oh, I mean, I offend people with this, but let me tell you. Here's what you did in school, and you're still doing it right now. You're writing a paper, I don't know, a couple of pages, 10 pages, 3 pages. You're attaching a $100 bill to it. And you're handing it to your instructor and saying, here, will you read this? Sure thing. 
<laughs> you think that's not what's happening? Really, seriously, do you think that's not what's happening? This is what's happening. And people say, oh, it's so awful, Larry, that you talk about money. <laughs> now, let's say you go outside being a student. I'm not just talking about beyond the academy. Let's say you want to be a professor and you write an article. Is that what's going to happen? Whether you're a professor or a consultant or in any other kind of real world operation, are you going to write something and hand a hundred bucks to your readers to read it? He's nodding his head. Is that what's going to happen? What's going to happen now? They don't have to read it. Not only this, but it's more than that. What's going to happen? If you waste your time, they're going to make this. You want to get paid, right? Yes? No? Yeah. Do you? Forgive me, I won't pick on her. Do you want to get paid? <laughs> Anybody here want to get paid? Here's what you're saying now. You're saying, here, you can read this, but you got to pay me first. You can't read this until you pay me. Pay me. And I have to tell you, you have 16, 18, 20 years of not doing that. You've never written anything, I would argue, at all. The problem is that doesn't just leave you neutral, that leaves you with terrible habits. Why is it so hard for really smart people to write well? One of the reasons is they have 20 years of bad habits. The habit was they weren't writing to people who were doing this. What were they writing to? What, are your te what were your teachers doing when you sent them papers? Were they using your papers to change the way they saw the world? What were they using your papers to do? Very roughly put, you have learned to write in what Wittgenstein would call a form of life in which your readers were paid to care about you. Your teachers read your stuff because they were paid to read it to find out about you. Well, he's handed in this new thing. I'm going to read this. Why? Because somebody's paying me to assess him. That's never going to happen again, right? Whether you're in the academy or not, nobody is ever going to be paid to care about you ever again. But because you guys are so successful, you are the best people in the world at student kind of writing. You're very good at it. Trouble is, that's not what you need to do afterwards, after school. As a director of the writing program here on campus, I often get asked about helping undergraduates make the transition from high school to college. We help them. It's not very difficult. Or I'm asked to help make undergraduate students make the transition from undergraduate to graduate school. We help them. It's not very difficult. What is really difficult is the transition from being in school to being out of school. Because this value issue suddenly dominates everything. And you've had 20 years of never having to deal with it. Never having to deal with it. So that's the big picture hard part of it. Um, as I said, we're going to talk about some specifics, but those specifics, in my mind, only make any sense inside this larger problem of what I've stealing from Wittgenstein called the form of life. You end up a different form of life. Language is a different activity. It's a different language game from being in school to being out of school. So I don't want to talk. We'll talk about text, but I only want to talk about it in terms of the language game of readers who need you to make your text valuable to them in their reading process. Because I'm claiming that's a different language game. All right, turn to the first page of your handout and let's get started looking at some specifics. All right, now let's say somebody asks you the question, how are these texts different? And I hope now for the rest of your life you have a little voice in the back of your head that says, well, wait a minute, what? let's talk about readers and function, but let's imagine that you're not talking about that and they won't let you talk about that. They're just saying, how are these texts as texts different? 
Point to something that's different. All right? So here's what, here's what somebody's going to tell you when you go out to work in a place that's not the academy. They're going to say, oh my god, use short sentences. They will say that to you. Use short sentences. And they will point to this and say, look, these are shorter sentences. They won't ask the question, why are they shorter sentences? What is it about the readers that makes it shorter sentences? What do you think it is about the readers of the New York Times that makes it a good idea to use shorter sentences then? What's the value to a reader of a New York Times op-ed piece? What makes it valuable to them? One thing is they, they, they're probably, they're, they may not be sitting at their desk reading it. They're reading it on a train, someplace in a car, moving, walking or something. So a, shorter, a longer sentence is going to demand their attention for milliseconds longer. That's actually kind of awkward and that kind of. But the other thing is why they're, re what value do they get out of it? Present and what? Entertain. And if you think that's not the case, talk to the editors of the New York Times. <coughs> Why do, people watch, why do people watch television or listen to radio that have people, we, we bemoan it all the time. Oh, why do people listen to these demagogic uh, journalists who are just spouting their opinions? Why are they listening to Rush Limbaugh and Rachel Maddow? Why don't they just get objective journalism? Well, why don't they? Because it's more fun. <laughs> I have lots of colleagues who come to me, Roger's not one of them, trying to get stuff published in the New York Times. And the first thing I say to them is, the New York Times is not going to publish this because nobody's going to read it. And they say, but people are interested in this. Everybody's interested in the Ukraine right now. Everybody's interested in this. But this is boring. And then what do you suppose they do? They look at me. And they say, well, I can't be responsible for the fact that people aren't rigorous in their thinking. Yeah, see, this is the mistake you're making. Because what I do for a living is not think about the relationship between the writer and the world or the text and the world. My job is to think about how readers read. You're thinking about content. I'm thinking about closer to somebody standing in a subway and the process that's actually going on in their cognitive processing to, to do, do this. And you know what happens? When we read, we're using all kinds of cognitive processing to use this text to think about the world. And what happens when you interfere with the cognitive process? When the text makes it hard to do the process. What happens to readers when there's something about the text that makes it interfering with the reading process? What do you suppose readers do? I can tell you what they do. The first thing is they slow down. The second thing is they don't understand. The third thing is they get annoyed. And the fourth thing is they stop. And I got all kinds of people in your position who say, well, that's not my responsibility. Isn't it their job to read? When they're teachers, you've been writing, you've been writing ineffectively, and your readers haven't put it down. Why not? Because you were paying them to read it. When that stops happening, now your job is to make sure that process is valuable for the reader all the time. And you've never had to do that before. You've never had to make the reading process feel valuable for the readers as they go.